Now, back in 1992, I published a book called The uh, See, I Told You So, and Chapter 6 was entitled Dead White Guys, or What the History Books Never Told You, The True Story of Thanksgiving. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we've done this story again in a different way for a different readership. The first in the children's book series, Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims, also discusses the first Thanksgiving. In that book, we actually time travel back to it. And the readers of the book are actually taken to the first Thanksgiving. They're taken back to Plymouth Colony, where the pilgrims landed. Uh, it's the first book in the series, and it's it's the book from which all the others flow in terms of the founding of the country. And it's it's the same story told in a different way for a different readership, obviously. Uh, the Rush Revere books are aimed at 8 to 10, maybe up to 12. But we have learned that there are adults reading and telling us that they have learned things they didn't know because they weren't taught properly. But things are happening with these books exactly what we dreamed would happen, that parents and grandparents are reading the books either to their children or grandchildren or reading with them. And it's becoming a, a family activity. But here's the real story. And even today, I shared with you a story from the Huffington Post, which totally mischaracterizes the first Thanksgiving. In fact, let me find, if I put that in the right stack where I can get to it quickly, the way they treated it, because, yeah, here it is. When the Mayflower pilgrims landed in New England in the early 17th century, they established a harvest celebration that would later become known as Thanksgiving by sitting down with the Native Americans gracious enough to share their land and way of life. And we all know how that turned out. The pilgrims eventually killed the Indians, conquered their land, and took everything from them. That's the modern, multicultural way Thanksgiving is taught. Native Americans were here minding their own business. The pilgrims showed up. They were incapable. They were incompetent of feeding themselves. They didn't have any hotels. There weren't any houses. They couldn't have gotten by, but not the Indians. And the Indians shared everything with them, and in gratitude, the pilgrims wiped them out. That is so far from the truth of the story of Thanksgiving that it's more than a shame. The story of the pilgrims begins in the early part of the 17th century. The Church of England under King James I was persecuting anybody and everyone who did not recognize its absolute civil and spiritual authority. Those who challenged ecclesiastical authority and those who believed strongly in freedom of worship were hunted down, they were imprisoned, and sometimes executed for their beliefs. A group of separatists first fled to Holland and established a community. After 11 years, about 40 of them agreed to make a very perilous journey to the New World across the Atlantic Ocean, where they would certainly face hardships, but at least they could live and worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences. On August 1, 1620, the Mayflower set sail. It carried a total of 102 passengers, including 40 pilgrims, led by William Bradford. On the journey, Bradford set up an agreement, a contract, that established just and equal laws for all members of the new community, irrespective of their religious beliefs. Now, where did the revolutionary ideas expressed in the Mayflower Compact come from? They came from the Bible. The pilgrims were a people completely steeped in the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. The pilgrims were religious, and they came here to establish freedom of religion. They fled and crossed an entire ocean to escape religious persecution. They looked at the ancient Israelites for their example, and because of the biblical precedents set forth in Scripture, they never doubted that their experiment would work. But it was not a pleasure cruise. 
The journey to the New World was long and arduous. When the Pilgrims landed in New England in November, they found, according to William Bradford's detailed journal, a cold, barren, desolate wilderness. There were no friends to greet them, he wrote. There were no houses to shelter them. There were no inns where they could refresh themselves, and the sacrifice they had made for freedom was just beginning. During the first winter, half the pilgrims, including William Bradford's own wife, died of either starvation, sickness, or exposure. Many of them lived on the Mayflower for months while houses and other shelters were being built. When spring finally came, Indians, indeed, taught the settlers how to plant corn, how to fish for cod, how to skin beavers for coats. And life improved with the coming of spring for the pilgrims. But even with all this, they did not yet prosper. Now, this is important to understand because this is where modern American history lessons often end. Thanksgiving is actually explained in some textbooks as a holiday for which the pilgrims gave thanks to the Indians for saving their lives rather than as a devout expression of gratitude grounded in the Bible. The original Thanksgiving was a thanks to God. It was not a thanks to the Indians. This is not to disparage the Indians or the Native Americans. The pilgrims did not. But it was not a thanks to the, to the, to the Indians for saving the pilgrims. The pilgrims thanked God. But it's more detailed than this. Here's the part that's been omitted. Here's the part that the huffing and puffington post either doesn't know or omitted today. The original contract the pilgrims had entered into with their merchant sponsors in London. They didn't have the money to do this. They were beholden to people who funded them. And they entered into contracts with these merchant sponsors. They call for everything that they produce to go into a common store, and each member of the community was entitled to one common share. All of the land they cleared and all of the houses they built belonged to the community as well. They were going to distribute it equally. Everybody was going to get an equal share of whatever everybody combined produced. All of the land they cleared and the houses they built belonged to the community, not to any individual. Nobody owned anything. They just had a share in it. It was a commune, folks. And it was this way by contract, by design. It was the forerunner to communes we saw in the 60s and 70s in California. It was, it was complete with organic vegetables, by the way. They could grow no other than organic William Bradford, who had become a new governor of the colony, recognized that this form of collectivism was as costly and destructive to the pilgrims as that first harsh winter, which had taken so many lives. It just wasn't working. There wasn't any prosperity. William Bradford, his own journal, decided to take bold action. Bradford assigned a plot of land to each family to work and manage, and whatever they produced was theirs. Any the overages they could sell or share or do whatever they wanted with. But what happened, essentially, was that Bradford turned loose the power of the marketplace. If you're saying it to yourself, you're right. The pilgrims had discovered and experimented with what could only be described as socialism, and it failed. It did not work. What Bradford and his community found was that the most creative and industrious people had no incentive to work any harder than anybody else unless they could utilize the power of personal motivation. If everybody got the same no matter what the end result was, and if everybody got the same no matter how hard they worked, they were all essentially members of a union and all socialized. Now, most of the rest of the world's been experimenting with socialism for well over 100 years, trying to refine it, perfect it, reinvent it. The pilgrims decided early on, didn't take long for them to realize it doesn't work, and they scrapped it permanently. You're not taught this. Nobody is taught this. Even today, in the true story of Thanksgiving, it was an epic failure of socialism. What Bradford wrote about this experiment should be in every 
school child's history lesson. If it were, we might prevent much needless suffering in the future. Remember, this book is written 21 years ago, or maybe 19 years ago. It's 1992. The experience we had, this is Bradford writing, the experience that we had in this common course and condition tried sundry years that by taking away property and bringing community into a common wealth would make them happy and flourishing as if they were wiser than God, Bradford wrote. But this community, so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. For young men that were most able and fit for labor and service repined that they should spend their lives and strength to work for other men's wives and children without being paid for it, without any recompense. That was thought to be injustice. Why should you work for other people when you can't work for yourself? What's the point? Bradford was saying it's not working here. There's no personal incentive. And there were slots. Not all these people were cream of the crop. Some of them sat around, didn't do anything, while others did everything. The pilgrims found, folks, that people could not be expected to do their best work without incentive. So what'd they try next? Free enterprise. William Bradford and the Pilgrims unharnessed, unharnessed the power of good old free enterprise by invoking the principle of private property. Every family was assigned its own plot of land to work, and they were permitted to market its own products, crops, sell whatever overages they had. What was the result? Well, here's what William Bradford wrote. This is in his journal. This had very good success. For it made all hands industrious, so as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been. It's, it's an amazing story of what happened. In no time, the pilgrims found they had more food than they could eat themselves. Now, this is where it gets really good, folks. If you're laboring under the misconception that I was, that I was taught in school. So they set up trading posts. They exchanged goods with the Indians. They produced more than they needed for themselves. They started doing business with the Indians. They exchanged goods. The profits allowed them to pay off their debts to the merchant sponsors in London and Holland. And the success and prosperity of the Plymouth settlement attracted more Europeans and began what came to be known as the Great Puritan Migration. It was a rousing economic success after an attempt to establish themselves under socialism. It was not the name they knew. They used commune, uh, communal, so forth. But it did not work. And they had such great success that it began a migration of others who heard about it and wanted in on the action. And the first Thanksgiving was the pilgrims, indeed getting together with the Indians, with whom they were trading. There's no question the Indians assisted them when they landed. But it's not true that the pilgrims then took advantage of them, conquered them, killed them, and took their land. They ended up trading with all of this, and this whole story is written about in a way that eight to ten year olds understand it and are taken right to it in the first Rush Revere book, Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims. I was never taught this. I didn't until I started researching that book back in 1992. This, that was the first I had heard of why the Pilgrims are really thankful. It was thanks to God, it was the virtue of gratitude, which is all through George Washington's inaugural Thanksgiving address. Brief timeout. We will continue with more after this. Don't go away.